Recording on. Well, the recording is on. Welcome, everybody, to BC308. Um, I had just started doing a little review of uh, the, the book of Revelation, just the previous chapters. And I had forgotten to turn the recording button on. And uh, Christopher reminded me. So uh, we're a few minutes into the class. Uh, uh, but we're just doing a quick review of things that we've already spoken. Thank you, Christopher. So we're just doing a review, and we in uh, chap you know we've covered little chapters fourteen. I'm just reviewing some highlights of these chapters. We saw in chapter twelve how uh, you know chapters eleven, twelve, and thirteen they start in the middle of the tribulation on, and uh, um, chapter chapter eleven. Uh, is about the two witnesses uh, who have been uh, who are doing the ministry in the second half of the tribulation. They they uh, they are in Jerusalem. They're doing mighty signs and wonders. The whole world is watching them. They minister for three and a half years. Chapter twelve is um, how the anti how Satan sorry. How Satan is going after Israel. He knows his time is short. So he's going after Israel and he's going after those who have the testimony of the Lord Jesus. Chapter 13 is about how the Antichrist and the false prophet, the beast and the second beast. And we see that in chapter 13, the Antichrist is drawing worship to himself. And uh, the false prophet is assisting in this whole thing. He's setting up an image of the beast, and he's getting people to worship the image of the beast. Um, the false prophet. Um, so basically, we see two things happen. One is a global economic system that tries to control people in their buying and selling, and a global religious system that tries to get people to worship the Antichrist, the image of the beast. So these two things we see um, introduced in chapter 13. And then we came to chapter 14, which is, uh, again, uh, a chapter that uh, is telling us that here are some other things that are going to happen. There's a chapter of announcements. In chapter 14, the first part of chapter 14, we see the 144,000 Jews in heaven. Uh, so we were saying last class, last week, uh, we don't know exactly how they get to heaven, whether they die and, and they were resurrected and then taken up into heaven or were they just raptured directly into heaven um, it's not very clear but going by the text especially by the word the first fruits uh, it's it's very likely that they died and were resurrected or they experienced this resurrection so glorified bodies that they were first fruits uh, are redeemed from among men in the tribulation, during the tribulation. Because at the end of the tribulation, every believer who died during the tribulation will be raised up. So that is there, that's coming up. But these people are getting it ahead of time. So they are early, their first fruits of what others would experience, uh, which is they died during the tribulation, but they received, they resurrected and received glorified bodies. So most likely going by that word first fruits, and by the fact that they were redeemed from among men during the tribulation, we uh, we can presume, and we can't say for sure, but we can presume that uh, perhaps they died, they they were resurrected, they received glorified bodies, and they were taken up into heaven uh, during the tribulation. Okay, so that is up to verse five, Revelation chapter fourteen, verse five. We're going to pick up now in verse six onwards. And uh, 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 read uh, from here. So, Revelation chapter 14, starting from verse 6. Could somebody read up till verse 13? Um, sorry, we'll take, uh, we'll take turns. So each one can read three verses. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 13, please. Three verses each. The proclamation of three angels. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, 
tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of wrath, of her fornication. And another angel, a third followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives a mark on his forehead, or on his head, or in his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, pour full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, those worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Mm -hmm. Verses 12 and 13, please. Here is the faces. Here is the faces of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Okay. Thank you. So, um, in Revelation 14, verse 5 onwards, um, what we actually see is we see God use five angelic proclamations. That means there are five angels commissioned by God, sent by God, to make some announcements or proclamations. So we've read three of them. The first angel, that's in verse 6, is announcing the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue. So there's one angel saying, hey, people, you need to worship God. You need to worship the true and living God. Now, this is um, something unusual, or let's say, uh, I would say, uh, maybe not unusual, but un uh, uncommon, because we know that in the church age, the Lord has appointed the church to proclaim the gospel. So the church age, meaning from the day of Pentecost, around AD 30, to the time the church is here on earth and until the church is raptured, the responsibility of proclaiming the everlasting gospel is on the church. In love and then angels appear to people, uh, that does happen, but it's not all the time. People or the responsibility to proclaim the everlasting gospel to the nations is given to the church. But now we're seeing something very unusual happen in the second half of the tribulation, Revelation 14, that an angel of God is proclaiming the everlasting gospel to people of every nation, tribe, and tongue, and basically getting people to turn to God. So, why God would do that at that time? Again, it's something that we could think about. Uh, we could share some thoughts on that. One reason can be, well, the church has been taken out of the way. Of course, there are people believing in Jesus, but many of them are being killed, right? Because that's what the devil is doing. In Revelation 12, we saw how he's going out with vengeance against everybody who has a word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil is going out after them. The Antichrist is going after them. The false prophet is going after anyone who believes in Jesus. So uh, you can imagine these people are being killed. And so the church is not there. Uh, the people who are there are being killed. So it's most likely these two reasons are contributing to why God is using an angel to proclaim the gospel to the nations. Uh, that's just just thought. I'm not saying we can prove it from the scriptures. I'm just saying, you know, we're just reasoning, we're thinking. Um, 
there's also in some some uh, books that you might read um, some people would even take this further and say well uh, maybe you know this this proclamation of the gospel to the nations could actually very well be uh, because the word angel simply um, the word angel in its generic form means messenger now it could refer to any kind of messenger human or, or angelic and so some people you know venture out to say that maybe these are satellites that are going around the world you know that are constantly beaming the gospel to all the nations which is happening right now and there are satellites out there where the the, 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 the gospel is being beamed all around the world so some people venture out to say maybe that's what could happen well we don't know uh, we just stay with the context, the context is referring to angelic beings because we have four other angels doing some certain announcements. So we just stay with that and say, well, the four other angels have to be angelic beings. So then this one also is an angelic being. So, but, the, but, but it's interesting to think that this contrast between the church age and what happens in the tribulation is an interesting thought that God is using angel an angel to proclaim the everlasting gospel. The second angel is making another announcement, verse 8, that Babylon is fallen. So they're making announcements in advance, similar to what we saw you know, uh, earlier on when um, uh, uh, towards the end of chapter, uh, uh, chapter 11, second half chapter, where there was an announcement made about the kingdoms of the earth becoming the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. Meaning they're announcing that this is coming, it's coming, it's very close. So here's another angel announcing that Babylon is fallen. Now, when we get to chapters 17 and 18, we will see what this Babylon is. But, baby, but basically, uh, chapter 17 talks about a mystery Babylon. And chapter 18 talks about the great city Babylon. Uh, they're both using the same term Babylon, but are referencing two different things. But this angel is announcing the fall of Babylon, of both Mystery Babylon and the City Babylon, chapter 17 and 18, which will happen then. But this announcement is coming, hey, Babylon has fallen. Basically, it's telling people, don't put your trust in Babylon. It's going to collapse. It's going to come down. So the angel is warning. Third angel, verse 9, is a very stern warning. It's a very clear warning. This angel is saying, don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't worship the beast. Don't. Because if you do, you will not be able to stand before God. You'll be sent away forever from the presence of God. So here's the third angel warning the people not to receive the mark of the beast. So the situation on earth is going to be so grievous that God is actually going to have these angelic messengers announcing these things around the world. Probably angelic appearances coming, happening, uh, visible appearances coming forth to different people all around the world, giving them these messages. And this third angel is, is warning people, don't receive the mark of the beast because there's only one option, only one option. You've got to endure, verse 12. You've got to have patience. You've got to endure. You've got to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's the only option. So, again, this reaffirms the fact that there will be people who have the faith of Jesus during the tribulation. There will be people being saved. But it's going to be so hard, so difficult. Let's read from verse 14 to verse, verses 20. We'll read the next two angels, or what the next two angels announce. Verses 14 to verse 20, um, three verses each, please. Then I, then I looked at behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying, with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, 
Trust your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud trust in his sickle on, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar. The angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Mm. Thank you. So, next two angels are telling us what is going to happen. Very interesting. The next two angels are, are using some images that we are very familiar with. One is a sickle gathering harvest. Another is the wine press. You know, you cut the wine from the, uh, the cut the grapes from the wine and throw the wine into the wine press. So one sickle, one this fourth angel, sickle cutting the harvest. Fifth angel, sickle cutting grapes, putting it into the wine press. Now these are biblical images. Sickle cutting the harvest representing harvest of souls, people being brought into God's kingdom. Grapes being thrown into the wine press. Wine press representing judgment, because in those days, uh, uh, they threw the, the grapes into the, the vat, the big place, and then men would, uh, people would, stomp on it, you know, walk on that, like crush the grapes to get the juice. So it was a symbol of, symbolic of judgment. So basically, the next two angels are announcing two things are going to happen in this final, see, we are, we are in the final stages now of the tribulation. Two things are going to happen. There is going to be a great harvest of souls. Fourth angel. But there is also going to be great judgment on the people coming. So both are going to happen. There's going to be great harvest of souls, people, because there's the angel proclaiming the everlasting gospel. There's the angel warning people, don't receive the mark of the beast. There's an angel telling people Babylon is going to fall, so don't put your faith in Babylon. So there is going to be a great harvest of souls of people who have faith in Jesus. But there's also going to be a great judgment. Now, the judgment is going to be so great. Uh, verse 20 says, blood, blood is going to flow. Now, you translate that to, to you know, you translate that to modern um, uh, measurements. It's about 180 miles. Blood is going to flow for 180 miles from outside the city of Jerusalem. It's going to be as high as the horse's bridle. And you can imagine somebody sitting on a horse, have about five feet above the ground, or four or five feet above the ground, the horse's bridle. So that's how, that's just a picture, a description of the kind of judgment, devastation that's going to come. And the angels are announcing that. Right. So now we move into chapter 15. The cha chapter 15 is a preparation chapter, saying, okay, we're coming down now to the last set of judgments. This is like the final thing, the second woe, the final woe, the last set of judgments. 
These are the bowls. Seven bowls of judgments are going to be poured out on the earth. And it's the angels are getting ready for this. And we are now coming towards the end of the tribulation. What is going to happen? So chapter 15 is a small chapter. Let's read the full chapter, three verses each place, and then we will go forward. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass, glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast and its image, and over the number of its name. They held the harps given them by God, and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who is not scared, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and the century of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the century came the seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with the golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So chapter 15 is a short chapter, but it tells us two important things. One, that during this tribulation, there are going to be multitudes of people who have victory over the beast. So while the Antichrist, the beast, is going to do his work, like we read in chapter 13, try to get people to worship the image of the beast, take the mark of the beast, there are going to be people who refuse it. They'll have victory over the beast and the image and the number. And we see that this multitude is standing and worshipping God in heaven. That means they have died, they have lost their lives physically, but in the, uh, the spirit is now in heaven and they're standing on the sea of glass before the throne of God worshipping. And then, so that's one assurance, one, 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 one part of what's happening. And then comes the time for the final set of seven judgments. The angels have become ready. And very interestingly, it's saying that at that moment, when these seven angels come up to, to pour out the wrath of God, this is the final set of seven judgments. It says, God's glory just fills the temple and no one is able to enter the temple until this last set of judgments is poured out. It's almost like, you know, God is revealing His glory and yet at the same time, God has to do this. He has to pour out this final set of judgments. And He's a God of great glory but he's also God of great justice. And this is an expression, the judgments are an expression of his judgment. 
towards sin and what's happening or what has happened on the earth. So we come into chapter 16, which just takes us through these last set of seven judgments, which when we when we come into the the last two, basically, the last two of the seven bowls of judgment. It is saying, okay, now at this time there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. So these bold judgments lead us into right into the battle of Armageddon, the build up towards the battle of Armageddon, the final, the climax of everything. And it's interesting that when you when we read, uh, especially the sixth bowl, it's interesting that today when you look at what's happening, it almost seem, seems like, hey, things are moving exactly in that direction, exactly in that direction, and we will see, we will see. Okay, so let's let's read this little by little. Let's read the first seven verses, please of Revelation 16, we will look at these last set of seven judgments, the seven bold judgments. Sir, uh, chapter, Revelation chapter 16, 1 to 7. Yes, please. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowl, bowls of wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. Mm. The third angel poured out his bowl into the, the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, and for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord, God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Mm. Thank you. So, the bold judgments. First, sores upon those who receive the mark of the beast. Really uh, destroying them. Second, the the water, uh, the, the the sea becoming blood, killing all the living creatures. Third, all the drinking water once again being affected. What is interesting, just as an observation, in this third bowl, there is, verse 5, there is an angel of the waters. You contrast this to the angel who was bound, or the angels who were bound to the river Euphrates, who, um, who were released to this is in chapter 9, you know, we read it earlier, chapter 9, uh, verse 14. The angels who were bound to the river Euphrates, and those angels, and it's Revelation 9, 14, 15, those angels connected to the river Euphrates actually went and caused destruction. Here, Revelation 16, 5, there's an angel of the waters. This angel is worshipping God. So it seems like, as we have said in the past, angels have territorial assignments. Um, that means they are connected to, or assigned to, I'm not saying all angels, but there are angels who have territorial assignments, both from God's angels as well as demonic spirits, demonic angels, which we have seen. And we see the book of Daniel, we're seeing it now coming, being highlighted 
in the book of Revelation. And this angel, this particular angel, Revelation 15, 16, sorry, verse 5, is associated geographically with the waters, stewarding or caring or taking care. But this angel is an angel that worships God, unlike the angels around the river Euphrates, that region, they were angels who instigated destruction or caused destruction. You see the difference. Just as a, as a side note. So, three bowls of judgment, each causing different devastations on the earth. Let's read on from verse 8 through to verse 16, please. And this is kind of bringing us to the final judgments. Revelation 8, Revelation 16, 8 through 16, please. Somebody, three verses each. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and he was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had power over this place. They did not repent and gave him glory. The fifth angel poured out his word on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People now their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and source. They did not repent of their deeds. Yes, you want me to continue? Uh, somebody, somebody else can do that. Thank you. Okay, Verse 12 onwards. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Ephraim, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world, to assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keep his garment on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Yeah, verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew. Armageddon. So, the fourth angel, verse number eight, the fourth angel is causing, uh, when that judgment is poured out, there is such intense heat from the sun. And people are so scorched with the heat. Now, if you want to look at it, look at this from you know, uh, uh, as a you know, as a scientific perspective. Now, God doesn't need to depend on the progress in science to make this happen. Obviously, God can just do it. But what I'm just pointing to is, from a scientific perspective, it's almost like the world is heading in that direction. Uh, with you know what we understand about climate change, the uh, the ozone layer being depleted, and, and therefore more and more of the Earth being exposed to the radiation from the sun, we are understanding those things from a scientific perspective. But here, it's almost like saying the thing that we are afraid of today is actually happening there in Revelation 16, 8 and 9. The heat from the sun is so intense, people are being scorched. I'm not saying God depends on science to make it. No, it's not. I'm just saying it's actually happening there. Revelation 16, 8 and 9. But we see that people don't repent. They are blaspheming God, some of the people on earth. The fifth judgment is uh, 
being poured out and uh, there is darkness and people are now in this this is a culmination of everything there are the source that are happening there are the waters that have been turned uh, uh, they're not able to be uh, to drink it they become like blood there is uh, intense heat now there is darkness and people are blaspheming God because of all of these things happening okay it's like almost the whole um, weather conditions have become chaotic and people are blaspheming God but now something significant happens in the sixth bowl the river Euphrates is dried up and it's interesting to see what's happening if, um, you know as recent news if you just look up uh, online on the river Euphrates uh, the water level is going down portions of it are drying up now it has been happening but it's even more so of late and now obviously you know from a from a biblical perspective and you look at it it's, oh that's quite interesting because here in Revelation 16 verse 12 the Bible said 2,000 years ago John wrote the river Euphrates would be dried up and so today when we see it that hey it's kind of getting there it becomes you know very interesting observation now some people of course you know you read these articles online uh, they explain it from a scientific perspective oh yeah because you know people are not caring for the river and all these things are happening the river is drying up you know that's from a, a environmental scientific perspective explanations are being given fine but Revelation 16 12 was written 2,000 years ago and it was foretold that the river Euphrates would dry up. Now, even if the river Euphrates was on full flow, uh, maybe even the water levels is rising, doesn't matter. God can make it dry up in an instant. But it's interesting, just as an observation, to see that these physical conditions are actually causing the water levels to go down and dry patches to appear in and around the river. But here in Revelation 16, 12, it's going to be dried up and it's going to enable armies to move now of course today we know that armies can you know fly and they move in so many different on 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 the seas fly on the air fly in the air but we also know that there are armies that move on the ground the tanks and so on and so it's going to facilitate that happening but the sixth bowl is very significant because it says in Revelation 16, 12, kings from the east, kings from the east are going to be prepared to do what? To attack. They're going to move into battle. All on this focal point in on the Mount Megiddo, so the northern part of Israel, the Valley of Megiddo, they are all going to come there. It's going to become a focal point. And so the drying up of the river Euphrates is one of the things that are saying, time has come. The armies of the East are going to get ready. They're going to move in. Now, another thing, significant thing is this. There is a spiritual dimension to this. He tells us in verses 13 and 14 that through the mouths of the beast and the false prophet originating from the dragon evil spirits are going to be released to go and instigate the nations it says there in verse 14 they go out to the kings of the earth. They're going out to kings representing the leaders of the earth to gather them together for this great battle. 
In other words, this sixth bowl judgment is very significant because it is the starting of the preparation for the Battle of Armageddon. The physical sign is the drying up of the river Euphrates. In the spiritual, Satan, the dragon, is releasing demonic powers through the Antichrist and the false prophet to instigate the leaders of the nations to get them ready to come in battle towards Israel. So that's the thing that's happening. Kings from the East are going to move in. Who's instigating them? The Antichrist and the false prophet. But really, it's demonic powers all at work, getting these people to come in. Now, the uh, when we when we study in detail from Ezekiel the 30th chapter, Daniel chapter 11, which we saw, the last part of Daniel 11, and Zechariah the 14th chapter, we see the, uh, and I, I'm jumping ahead of myself now, but we see that the build-up towards the Battle of Armageddon takes place in stages, because the first mover in this battle, and you read this in Ezekiel 38, it's described there, are the tribes from uh, Rosh, Jubal, these are tribes in Russia. So basically Russia moves first along with its Arab allies, Persia, Turkey, Egypt, they move in. So that's the first move. But Israel pushes them back. They go away. The next move is the kings of the East, the armies of the East mentioned here. That means, most likely, and uh, it isn't mentioned by name, but most likely, yes, yeah, thinking of a big country like China, joining hands with Russia, moving east of Jerusalem, east of Israel, moving in. And the final stage is all armies of the earth coming in to fight. There will be those who stand by Israel and there will be those who oppose Israel coming in to fight. And the valley of Meg Megiddo, northern part of Israel, becomes a place of conflict. Uh, and the, the final reason, this is Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. The final reason that these armies are moving in is, Joel 3, verse 2 says, they have come to divide up my land. So that's the final, you know, like, there are those nations who say, the land must be divided. There are those who say, no, we're standing by Israel. The land should not be divided. Big, what we would call as world war, which is Revelation 16, 16, the battle of Armageddon, the final battle. So, the sixth bowl is significant because it signals the beginning of the preparation for this final battle of Armageddon. All with me so far? I'm trying to tell it like a story. <laughs> you can imagine the movie happening. <laughs> okay, let's uh, take a little break. We'll come back and we will continue this from verse 17 onwards. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> 